Greetings in the awesome and wonderful and magnificent name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. I am Thomas Brown, pastor of the Mount Vernon Missionary Baptist Church, Auburn, Alabama, where Jesus is Lord and the devil is under our feet. It's Jacqueline Adams. Good evening to you tonight. I trust all is well with you. And I trust all is well with you um, and that you're walking in the favor of God and the, and the blessings of God. Uh, they are abundantly upon your life because we are some blessed people. Glory to God. This is a thankful Tuesday. Call a neighbor and call a friend and and uh, tell them that MTV is now live via Facebook. We always say God is good all of the time. Ms. Benson, good evening to you. Evangelist Patricia uh, Lujean Frazier, good evening to you. I trust that God is moving miraculously in your life, and we are continuously praying for your friend who had a stroke. God is able uh, to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask could ask of him or that we could think. And we are yet praying for those who are sick. Miss Yvonne H. Whitfield, good evening to you. Uh, Dr. Tina Mary Louise Holloway, good evening to you. And congratulations to Dr. Holloway. She has been promoted uh, in the military. Uh, I, want, I, I always miss, I always, I always, um, uh, mix the national God with the other God, but it's not the national God, it's the other God. But she was a lieutenant colonel, and last week she was promoted to a full colonel. So I'm going to have to start calling her Dr. Colonel Tina Holloway. Good evening, and God bless you, and con con congratulations for her, her making colonel. Uh, Brother Nathaniel, good evening to you, my brother. We serve the true and the living God. And uh, God is, as we say, Dr. Gina Jenin Borkins and Chris and to the Borkins family, good evening to you. Miss Martinetta Wilson, uh, good evening to you. Um, we are praying for our member, Miss Diane Preston. Uh, Reverend Robert Preston went to be with the Lord last week. He's going to be uh, buried tomorrow. And our funeral is tomorrow at Greater Peace. I think it's at one o'clock. Our, our prayers are with Miss Preston and the Preston family. Mayor Thomas, good evening to you. We'll give a few more of Mount Vernon members and our friends to join in. Coach Witt, good evening to you. I trust that God is moving faithfully in your life and to and into each of your lives. Miss Sonia Wilson and our friends uh, in Tuskegee, good evening evening to you. Uh, as we conclude tonight with uh, this letter to the Hebrew, uh, to the Hebrews, to the Jews, to the Israelites, um, known as um, the letter to Hebrews in the New Testament. Well, let's get started as we conclude this letter. I'm going to really, I'm going to really, really try to complete this letter tonight, but we'll see what the Lord has in store. We're in Hebrews chapter Number 13, Miss Enet Reese, good evening to you and a blessed uh, birthday one day ahead of time. Uh, God bless you also. We are concluding tonight, hopefully and prayerfully, uh, this letter uh, or epistle to the Hebrews. Remember, uh, theologians are not sure as to who writes it, to whom they were writing it, or the year they wrote it. What we do know, Miss Valerie Norm Riggins and Deacon Riggins, Robert Smith, good evening to you. What we do know is that it um, that this letter was written to some Jews, some Israelites, to some Hebrews. And uh, there are basically two, maybe three classes of people that uh, that were that, that, that makes up the audience, uh, that make up the audience, if you will, that were what we call Messianic Jews, and you understand that to be Jews who believe in the Messiah. And then there were those who were what the John the Revelator called lukewarm. They were they had one foot in Christianity and another foot in Judaism, and they didn't know which side they really wanted to be on. So there were some uh, 
scriptures and, and, and teachings for them. And then there were those who were in Judaism and had not yet come to Christianity. And there was some information for them too. So in order to really understand Hebrews, you have to put it in its proper context, each scripture in its proper context uh, to understand to whom exactly or what audience uh, they were actually writing, that the writer was actually writing to. Uh, remember when you are preaching, teaching, or studying Hebrews, remember the theme. And, and, and the theme throughout is better, it is superior, it is preferred. And basically, the idea is that the new covenant, Miss Annie Reese, good evening to you, that the Miss Carlisle, good evening to you, that the new covenant. Uh, the covenant of grace that comes along that Jesus Christ brings as it relates to dispensation is better, is preferred, and is superior, Bunny, to the old covenant. R remember in 1 and 2, uh, he talked about how the new covenant or Jesus was better than Moses, than the prophets, than the old sacrificial system that um, it was better than Melchizedek. It was better than the priestly order. It was better than the high priest. So Jesus is better. He is preferred. He is superior. For those who had come out of Judaism, the Messianic Jews, what they had was better than what they left. So why go back to something that's not better, that's not preferred, that's not superior? To those who were teeter-totting on who had one foot in Judaism and the other one in Christianity and wasn't feel fully committed to Christianity, therefore, by definition, were not saved. Uh, he's saying unto them, you need to come all the way out of Judaism because what's over here is better than what's over there. And those who were not saved, he was saying unto them, uh, you all need to come all the way over here because Jesus is preferred, Jesus is better, and Jesus is this old, this new covenant is better. Remember Matthew chapter five, Jesus said, I've not come to destroy the law, but I've come to fulfill it. So every word in the law, every jot, every tittle, every line, Mary Gunn, um, um, prophesied and talked about Jesus the Christ, his coming, Miss Patricia, good evening to you, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his imminent return. So now we're going to conclude uh, Hebrews Look at Hebrews chapter number 13 and verse number one. And basically what the writer does here, Mary Jackson, good evening to you. What the writer does here, the, the writer gives about in, in his concluding chapter, remember the original text had no chapters and verses, but uh, in, in this last chapter, uh, he gives about 13, 12, maybe 13 instructions. We can call them instructions. We can call them um, um, commands, or we can call them principles, whatever you want to call them. There are, he concludes with, with about, uh, 12, maybe 13 of them. And I'm going to try to cover all 12 or 13 of them tonight. Chapter 13, Hebrews, verse number one. And the first thing he principle, he gives us is a principle of brotherly love. Look at verse number one. He says, let brotherly love continue. He's writing unto these Jews, even as he's saying unto us who, who, who make up the body of Christ, he's saying, whatever you do, continue to walk in love. Glory to God. And I want to challenge somebody today, whatever is going on in your life, whatever is going on in the church, whatever negativism there may be, regardless to what people have done to you, regardless to what's going on, make sure you continue to walk in love. Now, now for, for those of you, Michelle, good evening to you. Uh, for those of you who understand the Greek words for love, uh, you may think here that he's talking about brotherly love because he says brotherly love continued. But in the original text, it, the, the word uh, the uh, agape love, what he's saying here is continue to love with the love of God. Let me say that again. Continue to love one another with the love that you can only get from God because there is a love that, emanate, that, uh, that emanates from God 
that only we can give when we know who God is. Remember they asked Jesus, the Pharisees and scribes, I'm sorry, the scribe came to him and asked him, um, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said, the first and great commandment is to love God. The second is to love neighbor as you love yourself. That's the kind of love he's talking about here. Dr. Patrick Brown, good evening to you, sir. That's the kind of love he's talking about here in verse one, where he says, let brotherly love continue. The foundation for any ship, relationship, friendship, it all has to be love. The love that can only emanate, uh, emanate from somebody who has experienced the love of God. Now, if you've never experienced the love of God, then you cannot give other people the love of God. But if you have experienced love, the reason we can forgive people is because we have been forgiven. The reason we can be patient with people is because some because God was patient with us. Glory to God. The reason we can love those who do us wrong is because God loved us when we did him wrong. The reason we can look beyond people's faults and love them in spite of their faults is because we've experienced the love of God that looks beyond, oh my God, preach Betty Brown's oldest boy, that looks beyond our thoughts and see our needs. First John chapter four, verse number 20 and 21, and say, you cannot love God whom you have not seen and hate your brother whom you walk among daily. You cannot do it. You cannot love me. You cannot bypass God's love. I mean, love. You, you cannot bypass mm, loving me and then go and try to love God. Let me, let me say it again. You cannot bypass loving earthly people and talking about I'm going to bypass you and love God. In order to love God, you must first love his children. I mean, when, I mean, first is not right because he said love God first. In order to love God, you in, in, in a God-like way, you must also love God's children. Yeah, let's put it that way because love begins with loving God, okay? And then uh, look at uh, John chapter number 13. John, St. John chapter number 13. And see, one of the areas that, that saints are really struggling in is loving those who don't love them. <laughs> Glory to God. I'm talking about you, me, all of us. We struggle in an area of loving people who don't love us or people who don't treat us the way we think we ought to be treated. John chapter number 13. I'm on the first principle now, and that is love. John 13, look at verse number 34. Glory to God. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. I told you, when you've experienced God's love, then you can learn how to love other folk. That you also love one another with the same love that God loved us. He says, I want you to love one another. And note what he says in verse 35, John 13, 35. He says, by this, by what? Not by how big the cross is around your neck. Not by how often you go to church, not by how spiritual you are, not by how much, how, how many tongues you speak in, not by how well you can preach, not by how well you can teach. He says, by this, what is the this? I'm glad you asked. Shall all men know that you are my disciple? And the word disciple there means a follower of another's teaching. Okay, he's saying, by this shall all men know that you really following me and following me in the way I want you to follow me. Notice, notice it, what he said. If you love one another. He says, loving one another is a indication to the world mm, that you are actually following me. Why? Because love begins with my daddy and then love comes from me because for God so loved the world that he gave me, I so loved the world that I gave my life. I'm talking about Jesus now. Glory to God. God loved you so much that he gave his son. Son loved you so much that he gave his life. And God says, and Jesus here is saying, the indication that you are a, this, a follower of Jesus is that you have God-like love one for another. Verse one, he says, let brotherly love continue. In other words, that they've already started it. Don't let anybody stop it right now. Don't let anybody come in and break the cycle of brotherly love or God-like love to each brother. That's number one. Number two, 
I told y'all he has about 12 principles of command. Principle one, let brother love continue or continue to love people uh, uh, in the family with a godly love. All right. Num number two, he says, make sure you are hospitable to the saints, to the brethren. Now, this really has a, a cultural context. I told you he was writing to Jews. OK, he, he, he was writing to Jews who in a certain who in that culture, because see, everything in the Bible is not directly applicable to us. It has to do with the culture. And, and, and you will really, really, really get in trouble or get confused if you try to apply all scripture to our 2021 culture. OK, he says be not forgetful to entertain strangers. Now, that does not mean let strange people sleep in your house. That's not what that means. Now, if you want to take that out of its context, that's what it means. If a stranger come along and, by, and, and they don't have a place to stay, let them stay in your house. The devil is a liar. That's not what the scripture is saying. You have to understand Jewish culture to understand what he means there. Back in those days, they didn't have any holiday inns, Bernie, Mayor Thomas. They didn't have any uh, a rich Carlton. They uh, they uh, uh, they they didn't have any. Um, I mean, I mean, what else? I mean, the motels, the hotel. Now they did have inns, but inns were mostly associated with prostitution and sexual immorality. So when the traveling saints would come to town, when the missionaries and the saints who were going from church to church, when they were um, uh, when they would come to town, they didn't want to stay in the inn, so they stayed with with uh, with with the saints. They stayed. They stayed with the brethren. And what and what the writer of Hebrews is saying here is be careful. Now, don't forget to entertain strength, mean, meaning the brethren. Why? Because some people have entertained strange and uh, entertained angels and been unaware. Now, a whole lot of people would take that all out of context. Talking about I may be angry. You're not an angel, you're a human being. Stop your lying. All right. No, he said, now there were people in the old testament who actually entertained angels. And, and perhaps, I don't know, maybe there are people that God sent in our lives that are angels in disguise. I don't know. Take that for, for what it were. The point is that we ought to be hospitable to the saints. Now, there was a time even in the African-American church, in, uh, uh, in the Negro church, when the evangelist would come to town, he would actually stay in people's houses. Glory to God. But but this text here is basically saying, make sure you are hospitable to the saints. If somebody needs something, feed them. If they're hungry, feed them. Close. If they need a place to stay, give them a place to stay. Glory to God. He does not mean strange people. All right. So he says, be hospitable. First Peter 4 and 8 and 9. That's first Peter 4, 8 and 9. Talked about being hospitable. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. Romans chapter 12, verse 13, admonishes us to be, to, to give, to be given to hospitality. Be kind to people. Glory to God. Because see, whatever you have, you, you are just a steward of it anyway. Let me say it again. Your house is just a steward. you just steward of it. It doesn't belong. You belong to God. Everything you have belongs to God. So you ought to be generous. The idea is to be generous. Now, how can we apply that to our culture? Be generous to people. If you have it to give and they need it, give it. If you have it to give, you can't give what you don't have. You can't supply what you don't have. If you have it to give, be hospitable and give it. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was clothed, you, uh, when I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you came to visit me. When I was in the hospital, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When do we do it? When you do it unto the least of mine, you do it unto me. Now, notice he said you entertain, some of you may entertain strangers and you are unaware. That's why you ought to be kind to everybody. Now, I don't know what the implication there is. I, you know, I, don't, I don't know what the difference between being uh, unkind to an angel or being un, unkind to human beings. I don't have the foggiest idea, but he makes that distinction that, <laughs> that some of you have entertained angels and have been unaware. If God sends an angel for you to entertain him, obviously there's a purpose. And if you be cold to that angel, you have flunked that test. Okay? Number two, be hospitable. He's closing his letter. Love, hospitality. Number three, he says, keep your empathy. 
No, note what it said. Remember that are in bonds. I'm sorry, in prison as bonds with them. And, and, and those that suffer adversity as, as yourself also in the body. Pastor, what does that mean? That means when you hurt, I hurt. When you in pain, I'm in pain. Now, to, to sympathize with somebody by definition means that I feel for you. This is not what he's talking about. He's saying, I feel what you feel. I'm able to put myself in your position mm, and then treat you accordingly as if I were in, if, as if I was in your position. Empathy. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 26. Can you have empathy with people? Can you feel what they feel? Or are you so cold? Glory to God. Until you think everybody down because they're supposed to be down. Uh, or you think everybody broke because they're supposed to be broke. You think everybody's sick because they're supposed to be sick. And you can't empathize with anybody because they call their situation the way they are. Galatians chapter 1 says you better be careful. Let me tell you what it says here, if I can quote it for you. It says, brethren, meaning that it's family talk. If one be overtaken in the fault, those that are spiritual shall renew such a one with the spiritual meekness. Verse 2, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Pastor. What was Paul saying there? He's saying that if your brother is if your brother is going through now, that's Galatians chapter six. If your brother is going through now, you better empathize with him or her and help him or her get up because tomorrow you may be down. Today is my day when when my children cutting the food. You better empathize with me because tomorrow may be your day. I'm down today. You better feel what I feel because you may be down tomorrow. I'm out today. I'm depressed today. I'm, I got the blues today. I, I, I've been exposed today. You better be careful because your life is not everything it should be. Then just like God exposed one tan, God can expose another one. So what he's saying here is be careful how you respond to people who are in jail. You better act like you in jail and treat them accordingly. Now let's extend that. Stop acting. Oh my God. He's saying you better treat people who are going through like you are going through because because grandmama and them said it this way, Sonia. They said every dog, Miss Renfro, has this day. And see, the reason nobody comes to your rescue is because you don't go to anybody's rescue. The reason people don't give a hoot when you down because you don't give a hoot when nobody else down. The reason nobody, oh my God, sends you flowers when your loved one die because you don't send anybody flowers when they love one die. The reason nobody's concerned about your health because you're concerned with nobody else's health. And let me put you on Bible ground. I hadn't planned on going here tonight. The Bible says, God be not deceived. God is not mocked, but whatsoever a man soweth, that he shall also reap. The reason don't anybody seem to care about you, because you don't seem to care about nobody. <laughs> Glory to God. If you want to be a friend, if you want a friend, show yourself friendly. He says you better empathize with people, because every dog, <laughs> preach boy, has his, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> has his or her day. Okay. He says, one, 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 love. Uh, uh, continue that love. Two, be hospitable. Three, show empathy. Four, he says, keep yourself sexually pure. Okay, Pastor, where are you going to get sexually pure? Verse four, he says, marriage is honorable and all the bears under fire. Now, I taught on sex and marriage. Go, go get the tape. But what he's saying here is that when you're married, keep your bed holy. Keep your bed undefiled because the only one need to be, not, not need, the only one that's supposed to be in your bed is the one you said I do to. And the only bed you're supposed to be in is the one that you said I do to. And he said the only reason, the only way sex does not defile you is if you are married and in your bed. I mean, when you, when you ain't got to be in your bed, you can just be in anybody's bed. You can do it wherever you want to do it. Well, okay, I don't, I, I, uh, I don't want to get tacky, but you can, well, you can do it any way you want to do it. <laughs> Glory to God. If you are married, I'm not going to go back over that. Go get the tape. He says, but people who are engaging in sexual immorality, he used the word homongers here, but we're in the Greek, uh, is sexual immorality. So why did he say homongers? Because there's something in theology called a uh, 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 semantic range, which, which means words can have different meanings 
under different conditions, and there's a range of meanings within the confine of the word. Here in the Greek, it was sexual misconduct. But those who engage in sexual misconduct and adultery, God will judge. So he's saying, here's what I need for y'all to do, is to keep yourself free from sexual immorality. And the, only, and the only people who has been given permission to have sexual intercourse mm, are those who are married. Let me say it again. The only people, Christian, that, that, that God gives, the Bible gives, to engage in sexual intercourse are those who are married to each other. That's all I got to say about sexual about sexual pure. I've got four done already. Love, verse one, ha uh, hospitality, verse two, empathy, verse three, sexual purity, verse number four. Number five, he says, be content. These are principles. Be content. L look at verse five. Let your, now I have no earthly idea why Miss Adams, why King James translators translated this word, let your conversation because that's really not the word in the Greek is not the word in the earlier translations it's not in the word in the newer translation really he's talking about lifestyle here um, maybe the word has that much uh, semantic uh, reign but he used the word and, and he used the word again in verse 7 and it's just not a good word for what the original authors were trying to convey so basically what they're saying in verse 5 is, um, let your lifestyle, which also would cover your conversation, be without covetous, covetousness. Stop desiring something that belongs to somebody else. Notice what he said, and be content. So what's the principle? Be content, here it is, and be content with such things as you have. He's saying, Miss Carrie Frazier, God bless you. Our prayers go, go out to the Frazier family. Uh, uh, Emerald's grandmama went home to be with the Lord yesterday and our prayers are with you. He says, let your lifestyle be without desiring stuff that belongs to somebody else. Covetedness, 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 and be content with such things that you have. Everyday, ordinary, Negro term. Stop murmuring and stop complaining and be content. Now, there's a difference, glory to God, between being content and being satisfied. Be content with what you have, but I'm always looking for more. Paul said it this way. He says, I've learned to be content. So if you're going to be content, that's something you got to learn. Paul said, I've learned to be content with in whatsoever state I'm in. I've been up I've, and I don't complain. I've been down and don't complain. I've been all over the map and I don't complain. Why? Because I know in whom I believe. I know in whom I trust. I'm content. I'm not murmuring, but I'm looking for better. I'm not complaining because I'm thumbing a ride. I'm not complaining because I got to get a bus pass, but I'm looking for that car. I'm not complaining because because I'm living in an apartment, but I'm praying for the house. I'm not complaining that I'm single, but I'm praying for a husband. I'm not complaining that all my bills are not paid. I thank God that the lights are on. I thank God that the water is on, but I'm looking for a day where all my bills are paid and I can bless somebody else. I'm not complaining with what I got. I'm grateful, I'm thankful, but that I, but I know where I am is not my destination. It's just my layover. I'm thankful for my layover, but I don't want to stay here. God hadn't destined me to stay here. So we got to be grateful for, to where we are, but we are not complaining. Glory to God. And we are not murmuring. First Corinthians 10, 10 and 11 talked about murmuring. Stop complaining all the time. Grandmama said, y'all complain with a loaf of bread under your, uh, 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 in, in your hand. Stop mummering and be content with what God has given you. And I promise you, if you are faithful with what you got, God will give you some more. And I almost said some more. If you are faithful over a few things, God will make you, that's Bible, ruler over many things. If you are faithful with that little money that he gives you, if you are faithful with that $200 a week check, 
and you give God his whatever you in your heart say God is God's that God is tithing is a good place to start but why there uh, uh, if, 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 if you are faithful over that $200 a week God will move you to 400 and if you're faithful over that he'll move you to 800 if you're faithful over that he'll move you to 8,000 I promise you it works be uh, understand me you have to bloom where God has you right now God has you here for a purpose you are on the other side of the desert but this is not your destiny this is just your training ground but you got to be faithful in your training ground and if you're faithful in your training ground God will elevate you he will promote you and some of you have been in training long enough it's time for your promotion glory to God God is going to promote you in due season and somebody ought to just type in it's my due season I claim it right now now if you're going to claim your due season whatever your season is you got to make sure you've done everything you you could do to move into that season because what good does it do for God to open up the door for you and you too pregnant to get through the door? What good does it do for God to open up the door and you too are, are depressed to get to the door? What good does it do for God to open up the door? Dr. Holloway, what you claiming now? Devil, the God just made you uh, uh, gave you a promotion to uh, Colonel, what you want to be, uh, 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 a four-star general. Well, claim it, but whatever you want to claim, go on and claim it. Claim president for all I care. Just claim it. Claim in due season. That's right, Jacqueline. It's your due season. Ms. Yvonne H. Whitfield, it's, I claim it. I declare it with you because some of you, some of you, have been in, in, in training for a long time, and you've been faithful. Oh, my God, you've been faithful, and that's your season. You, you, you've been giving out of your need. You've been pressing your way when you didn't feel like going. You've been loving your, now yeah, I'm not saying you've been perfect. You've been loving your enemies. You've been giving everywhere that you really didn't even have. Again. It's your season. He says, but be content with what you got. Be content with where you are. Why? Verse 6. I'm sorry. He said, he said, be content with they have. Why? He said, because God told you. I ain't going to leave you. Let, let, let me slow down and talk to somebody who think God has left you. God didn't left you. Now, God may pull back because he needs for you to walk by you. He needs you to walk. And strengthen your own legs. He's he been carrying you. Gosh, I, I haven't left you. I'm still here. But I have to give you more responsibility to take you where I'm trying to take you. If you fall, I, I, I'll catch you. If you cry, I'll dry tears from your eyes. But I've been carrying you. And now, I, it's, it, in order for you to go where you want to go, you got to learn to walk. I can't carry you anymore. And so you're stumbling. You're falling. you uh, uh, you confused. You don't know what's going on. I'm telling you what's going on. God is just making you walk. It's your season, but you got to walk. It's your season. You're going to have to do something. He says, I, I, uh, I won't leave you. And somebody need to get that in your spirit tonight. God said, I won't leave you. He says, nor forsake you. Forsake you mean to leave you in the hands of your enemies. You, you want to know why God will never leave you? Preach, boy. God will never forsake you because he had to forsake Jesus. You remember Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? In the Greek, he says, why have you left me down here in a lurch among my enemies? He won't leave you. So you have to practice his presence. Regardless to what's going on, you guys will go, okay, I know you're with me. It's painful, but I know you're with me. <laughs> Been through hell, but I know you, you were right there with me. I'm confused, but I know you're with me. Okay. I, I don't even, I can't see my way, but I know you are with me. Okay. Number one, love. Number two, hospitality. Number three, he, th these are principles or challenges you give me to be sexual, to have empathy, to be sexually pure. He, he, he says, he said, verse six, go, go along with that. So that we may boldly say here, here, because you know, 
he's with you because you're forsaken. Now you can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. Psalm 121, I believe it was David said, I will lift up mine eyes, glory to God, unto the hills from which cometh my help. My help come from the Lord. Because you know he won't leave you, you, you can boldly say every day, Lord, you my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. We, we're not walking in fear from, uh, from man. It doesn't matter what man do. Oh my God, do. It does, it does not matter. That's right. It does not matter what man will do. Great is he that is in you, in me, than he that is in the world. And guess what? Let me hit you to something. Come here. Man can't do more to you, no more to you than God allows. Let me say it again. If man did it to you, God allowed him to do it to you and it was for a purpose. If, if, if man did it to you, God allowed man to do it to you and it was for a purpose. And all things, Romans 8, 28. You see, these are Bible-based. Romans 8, 28. For, all, for, for we know that all things are working together for the good to them that love the Lord, to those are the called, watch this word, according to his purpose. I want to suggest to you tonight that you are in his purpose. And, and when you are in his purpose and you keep loving him, you have a promise, Miss Calloway, that all things, regardless to what it is, if you just keep loving God, will work for the good. Glory to God. All right. He says, he says in, in uh, okay, we, we talked about love one. We talked about hospitality two. We talked about empathy three, sexual purity four, contentment, stop murmuring uh, five. Look at number six, verse seven. He says, Remember them which have rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God. Now, we really don't know theologically and even contextually who he's talking about when he says those who have rule over you because he implied that they're dead and gone. Listen, remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, who faith follow, he said, follow their faith, considering the end of their lifestyle or their conversation. So, th so, th so that implies who may be talking about to these people, they were already dead and gone or have left on or have moved on. Some think it, it was uh, those who had brought these Christians to, to Christianity. Some, some say it were preachers that had come after they were saved. And then some even take it back to uh, Hebrews chapter 11, those faith warriors who serve to prove to us that it pays to walk by faith. And then in verse number eight, he says, Christ is Jesus Christ. Jesus is his name. Christ is his title. The same yesterday, today, and forever. That means now, now he's getting back now into his theme that Jesus is better. Okay. Because all those persons who brought them to Christ, followed them, they had faith, but Jesus is better. He's superior. He's preferred. Why? Because he never changes. He never changes. People who share the gospel with you will or will change. Some some plant, some water, some sun, and then the Holy Spirit get an increase. All right? But Jesus, watch this. He's preferred. He's better. He's superior. He says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and, and forever. He won't change on you. I, I may change because God knows I'm moody. I, you know, I'm I'm 61, and I I, I, I go through all kind of crazy changes, and and, and I'm one, you know, I'm, I'm moody. Probably, pro probably bipolar. I don't think they call it bipolar anymore. I think they call it man of, depress man of depressive now. Uh, uh, but, but Jesus is the same. Man is, is subject to change on you. But Jesus Christ is the same. Yesterday, back then, today, and he'll be the same tomorrow. You can depend on him. Ver verse number nine, he sticks with this theme of better, superior, and preferred. Okay, let's see if we can get through with it. Be not carried... Here's, uh, here, here's the, here's the, which one is this? Uh, here's the eighth, eighth uh, command or principle. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrine. Now, so y'all need to hear that. Stop looking, stop following strange and crazy theology. But how do you know if it's strange and crazy? You've got to learn to study for yourself. You've got to learn how to study. You, 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 
he, he said, stop being carried away. In, in other words, there were some false teachers had come and they were teaching some strange doctrine, some doctrine that were different from what who, who, whoever writes this letter and their and, and, and those who have brought them to Christ and that what Jesus taught. Now there, are many the, now, there are many different theological positions, all right, w is what I call, I'm not going to get into this tonight, but what I call denominational theology. And I'm one of the few preachers who have no problem with denominational theology. And what is denominational theology? That's the theology of a specific denomination. All right, you're going to always have it. We, we're not going to uh, uh, agree, and I'm saying that's okay. I'm saying we can love one another, and as long as we agree that Jesus is Lord on the basis of Christianity, we can differ on whether a woman can preach or not. Okay, we can differ on whether it's a fivefold ministry or whether it's the pastor and the deacons. We, we can differ whether speaking in tongues uh, uh, is glossolalia or it's some kind of unknown language where you're praying for somebody in China. We can disagree on that. We can disagree... At, uh, on, 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 on whether or not the church could, should be called the Church of Christ or it can be called the Mount Vernon Baptist Church. We can disagree on it. We can disagree on whether or not that should be music in the church or whether that should not be music in the church, okay? Because see, what happens is the, the very people who talk about the church, too, the, the church is too divided, we all need to believe one thing. What they mean is everybody needs to believe what I believe, which is not going to happen, so we might as well accept the nomination of theology and move on. Here's Here's... Here's what he's talking about, strange and diverse doctrine. Stick with the doctrine of your church. Stick with the theology of your church. If this is what you, if, if you go to the church of Christ and the church of Christ teaches that a man, that a woman, I'm sorry, that a woman can't teach a man, then stick with that. <laughs> Fine, because there is a biblical basis where they get it from. Now, I think they take it out of context, but who am I? All right, uh, um, um, if, if your denomination teach that uh, a woman can't wear pants, then don't wear pants. Or find your denomination, oh my God. Or, 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 or find your denomination that, that will let you wear, wear pants. That's all I'm saying is that we will always have denominational theology. And that's okay. Glory, glory to God. But, so he said, look, stop being carried away with diverse and strange doctrine. Get somewhere, sit your behind down and learn and adhere to what your denominational theology is. Let me say that again. Get somewhere. And see, some of y'all messed up because y'all listening to all so too many different denominational people. Let me say it again. You theologically messed up. You want to listen to Jake's. You want to listen to uh, um, 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 uh, Jamal. You, you want to listen to um, Charles Stanley. And then you want to listen to the apostle and then you want to listen to the prophet and you theologically messed up. Sit your behind down somewhere, get you some denominational theology and hold what you got because you're confused now. And the reason you're confused because you don't understand denominational theology and, you, and, and, and you're trying to make this thing fit and it ain't fitting because we don't agree. Get somewhere, get you some teaching OK, and sit your behind down somewhere. Now, I don't know who that's for. <laughs> Glory to God. He says, for it is it is a good thing. That the heart be established with grace, unmerited favor. Not with meats. Now he's now now, he, now he's going back to the old um, sacrificial um, uh, idea of the old covenant. Now he's comparing the old and the new covenant again. Let me see if I can get to this. Which have not profited them that have been, that have been occupied. Therein. Somebody had come in the church trying to teach them to go back to the old meat laws. Okay. And he said, no, it, it didn't even benefit them. Verse 10. For we have an altar. We, we don't know what altar he's talking about. Wherefore, they have no right to eat that which, that which served the tabernacle. The, the priest couldn't eat it. Okay. Verse number 11. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Okay. They had, uh, thank you, it's Leviticus 29. They had to take the meat out and burn it 
outside of the camp. Why do you say that? He's comparing that with Jesus Christ to prove that Jesus is better. Jesus is preferred. Here is, here is, here is complicated theology made simple that Jesus is preferred. Jesus is better. That Jesus is superior. Wherefore, Jesus also, there it is. Jesus also, Yeshua, also that he might sanctify. The word sanctify there means set apart for a divine cause. The people with his own blood suffered without the gate. Jesus was crucified outside the gates of Jerusalem. How? What did he do? He sanctified the people with his own blood. Guess what? His blood is superior, is better, is preferred to the blood of the goats and the lambs and the bulls. Verse 13. Here, here is the, I think it's the, which one is it? It is the, da, 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 it is the seventh. Seventh. No, it is, it's the eighth command. Let us, verse, verse, verse 13, is the eighth. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. Go unto who? Let us go to Jesus. Why? Because he's preferred. Do not go back to the old system. Do not go back to the old way. And anybody that tries to take you back under the law, run. Jesus fulfilled the law. And when, once it's fulfilled, Paul said you can be married to another, which is grace. Not going back under the law. Okay? Well, and one day I'm going to teach you what they really meant by the law. It's fascinating. I don't have time for that tonight. Okay? Um, um, verse number 14. For, we have, for here we have no continuing city, okay? but we seek one to come. <laughs> it's better. What we are seeking is better than the old city. Last week he talked about new old Jerusalem as opposed to new Jerusalem that's coming down from heaven. Glory to God. He said, we, he said we're seeking a city that's preferred, that's better. I told you last week, Jerusalem is not the holy city of the Christian. He talks about new Jerusalem. That's the holy city. Jerusalem is the holy city of the Jews. You know, now we make pilgrims back there just like, you know, um, 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 the Muslims and the Jews. But the real city um, uh, for the Christians is that holy city where the streets are paved with gold. Glory to God. Okay, verse number 15. By him, meeting Jesus, which is better, which is preferred, which is um, better, preferred, and uh, superior. By him, therefore, let us offer here, here the next command. Let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. We ought to always be praising God. Okay? Psalm 34 says, I will bless him when? At all times. And his praise shall continually be in my mouth. The interesting thing about that is the root word for praise and bless are pretty much the same word. Eulogio. That's where we get our word eulogy. I think I'm not pronouncing that exactly right, but that's the way I was taught it. Eulogio. You, legio, you, well, whole, legio, which means to speak. It means to speak well of. Bless the Lord means to speak well of him. Preach, boy. To praise the Lord means to speak well of him. So how in the world can we possibly praise him or speak well of him at all times? I'm glad you asked. Watch this. Here it is right here. That is the fruit of your lips, giving thanks to his name. The first way you praise him is with your lips, with your mouth. You speak well of him. Oral, orally, you talk about his goodness. You speak well of him. God's been good to me. God, God, God's blessed me. God woke me this morning. That's speaking well of him. But pastor, I can't do that all day. Watch the, watch the next verse. But to do good, the best way to speak well of him is not with what you say, but what you do. The writer here says, bless him with a sacrifice of praise, not only with what you say, but with what you do. Make sure your walk matches your talk. Because a whole lot of us can get in church and praise him and yasha ta 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 and get goose pimples and run all around the church and feel the anointing and get out of church and live like hell. Now, am I saying don't go to church and feel the anointing? No, I'm saying you only got half the issue. Don't lose that. Okay, keep that. Keep, your, keep the anointing. Because watch this. I, I'm going to blow some people's mind. You can go to church and get the anointing and leave church and raise hell. 
People do it all the time. That doesn't mean the anointing wasn't real. That just means the anointing is gone. Ow! Boy, I like that. And see, we look at people who leave church and raise hell, talking about that wasn't real in that. The devil is a liar. The anointing can come and the anointing can go. What is the anointing? The anointing is when the Holy Spirit comes on us to equip us to do a job. Glory to God. And see, many of you have it had right. You got the mechanics of the, I mean, you know how to let the anointing use you in church, and it is the anointing, and it's real. You just hadn't figured out how to take the anointing from church and when you leave church. And the writer here is saying it's a twofold strategy. You do it with your mouth and your body, and you praise God on Sunday at church. That's a good thing. Don't stop doing that. But you have to learn to extend your praise to when you leave there, to when you leave the church. They call the anointing will be on you as long as you let, let him. I can call it it because I understand that the word spirit in the Greek is neutral. Okay, and I understand that God uh, is, is, is not, quote, a, a man. God is a spirit, and spirits do not have genders. They, don't, they do not have penises. They do not have vaginas. They are spirit. Spirits don't have bodies. But so that I don't make theologians mad, I'm going to call the Holy Spirit a he. Because I get all kind of letters about pastor, you know. Yeah, okay, okay, whatever. All right, we're not going to argue about that. I'm, well, I love my point. See, I get the rattling off. And I love my point. Okay, all right. So, so, so the challenge is to is to take that anointing that I have when the music is playing and when the man of God is preaching and when the spirit when the other saints are uniting that spirituality with mine. How can I extend that beyond Sunday morning? See, because people want to call that false, and that ain't false. That's real. That, please understand me, that's real. It's just that they hadn't learned how to take that same spirit with them everywhere they go. Galatians 5, 16, y'all better know it by now. Walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. When you start stop walking in the spirit, you ain't no longer under the anointing. All right, can I finish the rest of these? Okay, he says, uh, and I'm in verse number 17, uh, which has to do with the uh, tenth command principle. He says, obey them which have rule over you, meaning now he's talking about your spiritual leader. And submit yourself. He, he said, do two things. Submit to, submit to leadership and obey leadership. But what if they're wrong? Well, if they're wrong, then you need to explain to them that they're wrong. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, all of us can, can be wrong. Now, if they stay wrong, then you need to find a new leader. Okay, <laughs> let me say that again. If they stay wrong, then you need to find you a new leader. All right? Okay, let me, uh, uh, let me say this about leadership. And um, I guess the Holy Spirit is taking me this way. There are no perfect pastors. Uh, I know I'm, I'm blowing somebody's mind. There are no perfect leaders. Now, so the question arises, how imperfect can your leader be? That's totally up to you. Woo, let, let me say that again. There are no perfect preachers, pastors. The question that you have to ask yourself, and it's a personal question, how imperfect can my pastor be, and I still respect what he's saying unto me. Because when you lose respect, okay, when you lose respect for your spiritual leaders, it's time for you to go. Stop sitting up in churches where you're mad at the preacher, not really listening to what he's saying. You are committing spiritual suicide. Now, you have to decide within your spirit how imperfect can my pastor be and I still respect him or her, okay? Because if you don't respect him or her, you're wasting everybody's time. 
There are no perfect preachers. But you have the right, based on the word of God, to set the standard of, of holiness for your leader. Okay? Everybody's salvation ought to be more important than sitting up in a, uh, in a church where they don't respect the man of God because of something that he may have done or a woman of God. I got a call uh, several months ago where this person wanted to, what you wanted my advice. And um, some things were going on at a church and, 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 and she says, uh, do you think I ought to leave? I said, I, I can't make that decision for you. I said, only you can decide how imperfect your pastor can be because all of us are imperfect. And um, I said, I wouldn't criticize you if you left. I wouldn't criticize you if you stay. Okay. Um, she said, thank you. Now, having said that, once you have concluded that this is where I'm, I'm going to submit, where I'm going to worship, okay? Yeah, you're right. She, uh, she's imperfect too. Um, <laughs> let, uh, uh, let me say this. Uh, my another con concerning uh, she's imperfect too. I, I'll never forget. I was, I, I was taking this lady somewhere and, and uh, she was complaining about my pastor, my pastor. Yeah, he, da, 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 da. I said, you know, we're all human. And I'll never forget, I, I'll never forget my letter, what she said to me. She said, yeah, preacher, we all human. But all of us didn't sign up to be pastors. Ooh. She said, y'all signed up for that. And because y'all signed up for it, we got the right to hold y'all to a higher standard. That blew my mind. I shall never forget that. She said, you all signed up for that. Where everybody has sinned, everybody didn't sign up to be a pastor. Okay? Now, having said that, once you decide that this is where I'm going to worship under this pastor, okay? Um, once you decide, then the, the, the Bible says obey and submit. If you can't obey and submit, they need to go where you can. Okay. Um, if you can't obey based on the word and submit, let me, uh, let me, uh, let me put it this way. If your pastor can't tell you to sit your behind down, then you need to go somewhere else. If your pa and I don't mean in, in that way. If, if you and your pastor are so close OK, if you and your pastor are so close where you're not going to obey and submit, then y'all too close. Let me say it again, because, see, some of y'all want to go to church, but you don't want to obey and you don't want to submit. Tell me he can't tell me nothing. Well, if he can't, if he or she can't tell you, then you ought not be there. You ought to go where somebody can tell you, tell you something. Because if you're going to be consistent with scripture, you got to obey, you got to submit, and submit means to come under the authority. And, and you, okay, I'm not going to say that. And you zip ahead, Fred, if you're sitting in a church where you don't want to obey and come under, uh, come under the authority. Got to follow leadership. Got to follow leadership. All right, he said, obey them. But watch this, for they watch for your soul. Now, if your pastor ain't watching for your soul, something wrong. And they then must give account because we're going to have given account for how we shepherd God's sheep. And you're going to have to give an account of how, what kind of sheep you are or, or were. Please understand, there is wrong and then there is just wrong. Okay, I mean, I mean, they are just there's wrong, and then there's just things that are just wrong that none of us ought to be putting up with, but that they may do it with joy because pastors want to pastor with joy and not with grief. But some of y'all make it so hard. Lord have mercy, I got a sermon called Preacher Killer. 
for that which is unprofitable for you. Okay. Verse 18. Wow, I got to go. Then he says in verse 18, which is the, uh, which one is this? Which is the 11th principle. Pray for us. Pray, pray for your leaders. Pray for your leaders. For we trust we have a good conscience in all things willing to live honestly. He said, man, we're doing the best we can. We, we, we trying to live an honest, good life. You know, when people are so hard on preachers, somebody, somebody said they're on Facebook, preachers doing everything. How you know what folk doing? Because the only way you really know what they're doing is if you're doing it with them. Now, if you're doing it with them, with them, then I'll listen to you. Say, okay, boo, then you know what you're talking about. Okay? Please understand me. The only way you know for a fact somebody is doing something is if you're doing it with them or you see or you seeing it with your own eyes and sometimes what you see ain't what you think you see. Kind of like the man that they thought were drunk, the man was on medicine. <laughs> Let me tell you again, they thought the man was drunk, the man was on medicine. So if you're not involved in it, you know, and we, we get so hard on preachers. Oh, preacher, you don't know what preacher's doing. Are preachers, are, 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 are some preachers doing it and everything? Yep. Mm -hmm. Is God pleased? No, he's not. <laughs> Glory to God. But if we start holding up, if y'all start holding us more accountable, maybe, maybe some of them will straighten up and do a little better. Problem is, you all don't hold preachers accountable. Well, 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 you know, they're all human. Yeah, but we signed up for something. I'm talking about me too. Because God knows I got issues, y'all. Don't forget what the lady said. Everybody got sin, but everybody didn't sign up to be spiritual leaders. And with signing up to be a spiritual leader, we have a spiritual responsibility. Okay? He says in verse 19, my nether, that, that may be right. But I beseech you rather, there's the next one, to do this that I may be restored, meaning I, re, uh, I may revisit to you sooner. All right. And now he get and now he's going to his conclusion. All right. He says, now the God of peace that brought you again from the dead, our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd to guide the God to grow of the sheep through the blood of, of the everlasting covenant. Now the covenant is everlasting. The old covenant was temporary. This covenant is everlasting. Make you perfect. Now, the, now, now the word perfect there has some interest in what, what, what I told you was semantic range. It could mean mature and it also could mean fully equipped. So some theologians say that, that God makes you fully equipped in every good work. And some say God makes you mature in every good work. I'm not sure which one it is. Take your pick and, and, and we'll move on. To make you perfect in every good work to do what? His will. Now, fully equipped and really there fits that, <laughs> all right? Working in you that which is well-pleasing to whom be glory forever and ever, amen. Verse number 22, he said, this is the 12th commandment or principle. And I beg you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation or the warning for I have written a letter unto you in few words. He said, man, go back over Hebrews and see what I wrote to you. Now, remember when they read this letter in the, when it was written, they didn't have chapters and they just read the whole letter in one setting. Okay. He said, know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty. Now, there's some problems there. Um, set at liberty uh, theologically. I mean, I'm just kind of giving you this free. Uh, we have no record where Timothy was in jail. So we don't know what Paul, I mean, Paul, Paul. So we really don't know what the writer means here by set at liberty. Some believe that he has a different preach, preaching assignment, that he's free from one preaching assignment to go to another. Problem is we, we just don't have record uh, where Paul, where, where Timothy was in jail. With whom, if he comes shortly, I will see you. Verse 24 is, is the final command. Salute all them that, that have ruled over you. In other words, greet them and all the saints, church folk, family. They are, they of Italy, greet you also. Then he concludes, grace be with you. Amen. Ooh. 
And that concludes our letter to Hebrews. Wow. We covered how many chapters? 13. We covered all, all 13 chapters. Hopefully we've learned something. Where are we going next week? I don't have the foggiest idea, but hopefully we learn something from Hebrews. Thank y'all for listening. Uh, Janie, I think we'll put, or somebody will, will put the way to give. M MTV, God bless y'all. I am so thankful that you all are yet giving. Uh, most of you are still giving online. Continue to do so. Uh, that's how you can support the ministry. If you cannot give it that way, um, you're welcome to cash app it to me at back at dollar sign back razor. Two of you sent uh, $25 last week. I put it towards the church anniversary, our church anniversary, the fourth Sunday in November. We're already preparing for it. I'm going to need about 100 folk to at least pledge a $100. Uh, I really need 200. But uh, those, our, our Facebook members, we're not going to ask you, our Facebook members, we're not going to ask you for a certain amount. We're asking Mount Vernon for $200, okay? I, I don't ask you all for money doing the broadcast, but if you can give to the church anniversary, please, please do. Send it to me. That's fine. I will send it directly to where it belongs. Um, I think we're about through with this uh, peanut butter drive. What else? Okay, okay. Now, the numbers are going up. We are still going to have... Um, in in house service uh please 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 wear your mask uh that's number one number two we're only seeing about 50 some people we have not reached capacity yet so please keep registering online if you have not had the vaccination watch us on facebook live okay now some of you i said this last week i'm gonna say it again some of you have become too comfortable not going to church that was a pre pre pandemic. You were you would be uneasy for not going to church. Now you miss for anything. Now Mount Vernon has enough members where we can actually alternate. Where fifty come this week, fifty come the next week, fifty come the next week, whatever. We have enough folk now to alternate, but we got the same thirty five or forty folk coming, and some of you all have gotten much too comfortable not being in church. We are social distancing. We are six feet apart. Uh, we all wear our mask. Okay. Now I don't want an overflow. <laughs> okay. So, but I'm telling some of you all that have become too comfortable not going to church. You need to get back in church. Okay. At least sometime. At, at least every other week if you don't come every week. Because if everybody came every week, then we couldn't hold 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 everybody. But for those of you who have gotten too comfortable out of church. You need to show your face. And they used to say in the club, you need to show your face in the place. Okay? <sighs> All right. So we'll be there Sunday. Um, I think that's it. Um, Y'all, please, please be safe. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to fuss for about two minutes. Stop stop being zipper head Fred talking about I hadn't been around anybody but my family. It's your family that's giving you the virus. <laughs> let, me take, let me say that again. It's your family that's not living in your house that's spreading the virus. I ain't around nobody but my family. They the one that's going all out getting, getting the virus. Okay? Protect yourself. Protect yourself. If you haven't, you know, do you realize that 90% of the people that's severely hospitalized and dying? No, 98 are, are they unvaccinated? I heard somebody, somebody posted the other day and I'm through. Covenant of Grace is going to minister tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. They said, you eat hot dogs and you won't take the virus because you don't know what's in it. I tell you, you do research how you get those hot dogs. Okay, just, just research how you get your hot dog. <laughs> Glory to God. That's it. God bless y'all. May he keep y'all. Pray for one another. I don't know where we're going next week, but Lord, the, uh, the Lord say so, we'll be here. Peace, y'all.